In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, uh, honestly, it's going to get a little more personal than I'm normally comfortable with. But I think that it's important. It's going to be a little different today, and you probably notice that I'm not wearing my usual plaid or dress shirt or, or whatever else I normally wear. I am wearing a t-shirt today, and it's not Friday, which is a little different. If you've been watching my show, you know I don't normally do that. The reason for that is because this shirt was made for me by a friend who helped raise money for my cancer fund using the shirt, selling it to people so that they could use the proceeds to donate to my cancer fund. So for those of you who don't know or have or, or kind of new to the program, I am a survivor of testicular cancer and I've been in remission since February. So the reason that today's an important day is that two years ago was the day that I found out that I had cancer. I was really terrified. I went in. That was the last thing that I was expecting to be diagnosed with when I went into the ER. And they told me what the verdict was. So this is the day that I had cancer. And by the way, just so you know, I do celebrate the day that I was declared cancer free as well. I know this seems odd, but I actually also celebrate the day that I was told I have cancer. And I know people find that kind of bizarre, but I'm going to tell you why. I think the best way to illustrate this is through scripture. So we'll go ahead and, and dive right into the gospel of Mark. 7, 32 through 37. They brought to him, talking about Jesus here, they brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven, with a deep sigh, he said to him, Epathia, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed. And he began speaking plainly, and he gave them orders not to tell anyone. But the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. In this story, you have Jesus Christ healing a man that has been unable to hear, and it seems as though that it's connected to his hearing, but he hasn't been able to speak either for a while. And when he's healed, Jesus tells him not to tell anyone. This is because this is early in Christ's ministry. He wants to teach people about the gospel, but he doesn't want people to catch on that he's the Christ. And specifically, healing the blind and the deaf are signs in the Old Testament of the Messiah. And that's part of the reason that Jesus didn't want word to spread for him too quickly because he knew that his time had not yet come. And so we see this earlier in the Gospels, that earlier in the Gospels when he would teach or when he would heal somebody, if it was something that was connected to the prophecies of the Messiah, he'd say, yeah, yeah, keep it down for right now. And what I find fascinating is that these guys, uh, specifically this deaf man that was healed, he was telling him and, and the other people that he healed, don't tell anyone yet. I'll heal you but just don't spread it around just yet what I've done. And the first thing that they do 
the more he protested them telling other people about what he had done for them, the more that they wanted to tell somebody and the louder that they proclaimed it. Now, granted, you get an order directly from Jesus. Obviously, the correct course of action is to follow. We see examples of this back, for example, with King Saul, that, that God said, I would rather you be obedient than offer sacrifice to me. And so obedience is the correct course of action. These guys did disobey a direct order from Jesus, and that was not okay. However, you got to love their enthusiasm. You've got to admire their passion. This is a guy who hasn't been able to speak probably four years. Um, it doesn't say how long he was deaf or how long he had this difficulty. But think about this. He didn't have the ability to speak. And we don't know much about his family life. Maybe he didn't have a wife or kids. But you would think that somebody in that position, the first thing that they would do is, is go to their loved ones and say, I love you, and, and communicate that thing that they had been unable to do. Remember, this is way before sign language. Communication was not nearly as easy back then if you were a deaf person as it is now. And what do they choose to do with this gift? What's the first thing that they do? They proclaim what Jesus has done for them. That's what's on their mind. That's what they want to do. you got to love that enthusiasm. And it actually explains why I celebrate the day that I got cancer as well as the day that I was cured of it. You know, I, I hated having cancer and chemo. I think any sane, rational person does. There were mornings where I'd wake up and the first thing I would do is puke my guts out because I was under the influence of chemo, and, and that's typically what happens. Granted, I had a lot less side effects than a lot of the people that were on different forms of it, but it was not a pleasant experience by any stretch of the imagination. So it's not that I'm celebrating that I went through that experience. If I had to be asked, would you go through it again, I'd say, heck no, not if I could avoid it. But what's important to note here, I think you have to look at it as a, a cost versus benefit analysis. And, and me being kind of a data guy, I tend to do that. So I'll let you know what I lost. First of all, as you can see pretty clearly from your camera, I lost my hair. Granted, a lot of it has, has grown back, but I mean everything down to the eyelashes. I had nothing. You'd be surprised how much stuff gets in your eye when you don't have eyelashes. I mean, all of it was gone. Uh, I was, I was basically smooth from head to toe. So I lost that. In a lot of ways, I lost my body because now I have scars and, and places where it hurts to this day because of my surgeries. And I got really fat on chemo because I, I couldn't stomach not having food in my stomach. The reason that I, like I just said, I would throw up in the morning is because I hadn't eaten anything. And so whenever I was hungry, that's when I would get sick. And because of that, I snacked all the time. I gained like 30, almost 40 pounds. And I've taken some of it off, but some of it's still there. And I may never get back to, to the way that I was beforehand. I was actually in pretty good shape before the chemo took place. I lost my independence. I was somebody that, I mean, being a young guy like I was, unattached, single, that kind of thing, uh, I just got up and went places. Didn't think much about it. You didn't do that when you were on chemo. I had to let people know where I was in case of emergencies. Um, I, I had to make sure that there were people around me that could help me if something happened. I missed out on a lot of stuff. Parties, social events. Couldn't do it anymore. Just because I was too sick. Even had to miss several times at church. I'd, I'd watch the service online, but it's not the same. And I needed an awful lot of help to get around. Sometimes I had to have people drive me around just because I couldn't do it. So I lost that. I lost my energy. I was always a very energetic person. And frankly, I don't need a whole lot of sleep. That all changed when I went on chemo. I mean, I was tired constantly. I would wake up from a nap exhausted and I had slept for like 11 hours that day. And it's a lot better now, but 
Still not the way that it was. Still have trouble with that. Lost in Oregon. I mean, I'm not going to get into any of the gruesome details, but that was major surgery, and it took a long time to recover from. I'm still not fully recovered from it, and that organ's never going to be back. It's just a part of me that's not there anymore. It sucks, but that's the way it is, and there's not a whole lot I can do about it. I even lost uh, a girl that I had been seeing. Now, granted, I don't think that she broke up with me because, you know, she found out I had cancer. I don't think that that's what happened. But because of that, it was a real strain being able to see her or being able to spend time with her. And frankly, I don't, I don't blame her for wanting to be with somebody that was healthy and vibrant and was going to be able to, to see her a lot more often, especially because she lived so far away. So, you know, we stopped seeing each other. She didn't want to see me anymore. And I hated it, but I understood. But it is something else that I really believe the cancer cost me. So there was a lot of unpleasantness in all of that. But I wanted to tell you what I gained. For one, humility. I realized that I wasn't invincible. That I couldn't just live the kind of life that I did beforehand. And I had to realize that a lot of the things that I was proud of, I mean, not that I was ever like a a built bodybuilder or something like that. But I mean, I was in really good shape and having all that taken away, especially as somebody who honestly kind of prided himself on always being healthy. I'd never been to the doctor. Um, when I went into the ER to get my cancer diagnosis two years ago, that was the first time I had been to the doctor since I was eight. I just never got sick ever. And that completely changed. I gained a level of humility that I would not have otherwise. I became much more empathetic. I'm going to be honest with you. Empathy does not come easy for me. I'm a facts and logic guy. I think you get that probably from watching the show. I don't easily connect with a person and really understand or feel their pain. It's not that I don't want to. It's just it, it's hard for me. It came a lot easier after I got can cancer. For example, when they would talk about some old person that was having trouble to get around, all of a sudden I understood that and how frustrating that was. When they were talking about somebody that had been sick, not even necessarily just with, with cancer, but couldn't leave the house for a little while, all of a sudden knew what that felt like. And so it became much easier for me to empathize with people. And that was an area that, frankly, I needed an awful lot of help in. And sort of going along with that, I gained compassion. I could see somebody and see their plight, and I cared a lot more than I did before. Not because I didn't care before, but it was a more immediate response, and I didn't have to think about it quite as much. Compassion came a little bit more naturally for me afterward, because I knew what it was like to really suffer. Not as much as a lot of other people. But the point is that experience changed the way that I thought about other people. Fellowship. I gained fellowship. I'd always had a good relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's different when you're fighting for your life. All of a sudden, it's kind of like being in a foxhole you bond with people a lot quicker when you're in that situation. When you have to rely on somebody to take care of you, you bond with them in a way that you just don't otherwise. And so in a lot of ways, I, I gained fellowship and became really more aware of the people that really cared about me. That's something that I honestly wish more people could have, not through cancer, obviously, but something that more people appreciated. And going along with that, there was a level of spiritual intimacy I felt, not just with other people, but with God in a way that I hadn't before. Felt closer to Him. Felt like I kind of had to be, to be honest. 
And yeah, I can academically know a lot of things about the scripture, and I do. I, I study it pretty frequently, much more than the average person. But it's different about reading about Job or Joseph or people that suffered in the scripture and getting a little taste of it yourself. You understand it on the academic level, but that broadens your understanding of Scripture when you go through something similar that they did. And finally, I, I gained reliance. I had to rely on God in a way I never had before. Now, obviously, academically, I understood every breath that I inhaled was a result of God doing something for me. Every beat of my heart is a blessing that comes directly from him creating it and creating me. But you become far more aware of things like that when you realize that all that could stop at any moment. It changes your perspective. And you start relying on God in a way that you never had to before. You start becoming much more aware of the fact that you are a lot more dependent on him to keep your body going to keep your spirit going. You realize how instrumental he is in your life. And I also had to learn to rely on other people too. Part of relying on God was relying on the people he put in your life to help you out with that. Whether it was my dad or my other family members that helped me out getting back and forth from the chemo treatments, or like I said earlier, the people at church that would give me a ride or come by and visit me. When you're plugged up to a machine like that and they're injecting poison into you and you need something to eat, you can't exactly just walk out of the facility and figure out what to do. You have to have people that care about you surrounding you so that they can help you out with things like that. People that were willing to make sacrifices of themselves. And in my case, that was even more true because I didn't have insurance at the time. Now, luckily, the charity program at Baptist helped me out an awful lot, too. But my first surgery and a lot of my early medical expenses were covered completely by people at church, my fraternity brothers, and sometimes people I didn't even know. It made me much more aware of the fact that I can't do it on my own, that I need God's help, and, and sometimes that help comes in the form of people he's put in your life. Sometimes probably that, don't, that aren't even aware of the fact that they're playing a role in God's providence. Look, I'm nowhere near where I need to be spiritually. Not even close. But I'm closer than I was before the cancer. And for that, I'm grateful. And for that, even though I know it's not, God's not the reason that I got cancer, I do think that he did what God normally does and make the best out of a horrible situation. And I was able to become closer to him because of that. Just like the guy in the passage that we looked at from Mark. I can't help but tell people what God has done for me. Now, in my case, it's a little different because I haven't been ordered not to. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks quite a lot about using your suffering as a testimony to others. And now I really have a better understanding of what that means. But I understand a little bit more this attitude from this deaf guy that Jesus healed. Because I'm telling you, with stage three cancer, the way that I had it in my numbers, there is no way that I should have been able to recover that quickly. I'm absolutely convinced and cannot be convinced otherwise that that was the direct result of prayers. My doctors were astonished that I bounced back as quickly as I did, especially considering what a slow start I got and how advanced my cancer was by the time they got to me. And the truth is, if it were not for the kindness of my brothers and sisters and complete strangers, I would be dead right now. There's no question about it. I would have died. This would have been a death sentence had it not been for them being able to pay my way to get my, the treatment that I needed. I am alive today because God stepped in and saved my life. Just like this guy. And because of that, in that same mindset, 
I can't help but tell people what God has done for me. Stay the course, friends. Oh, hey. What are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock, so go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. And if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then. In the meantime, I'm going to take a nap.